watched another terrible movie, guys. Demon Tongue. It's directed by Gavin Rapp, and it was shot in 2013. DVDs were printed in 2014. The film was released in 2016, and Amazon Prime claims it's from 2017. I assure you that the confusion will only get worse from here on out. The movie was distributed by Uncorked Entertainment, which is more or less A24, only for shitty garbage made by incompetent nobodies. Much like with A24, Uncorked was founded in 2012, a month before actually, in July, to A24's August. From then until now, Uncorked has released nearly three times as many films as A24, 173 to 60 at the time of this review. Where A24 has had numerous films met with wide acclaim, such as Ex Machina, Lady Bird, and Best Picture winner Moonlight, Uncorked has responded with hits such as The Thirteenth Friday, The Burning Dead, and Bro, What Happened? Starring Jamie Kennedy. Bro, what happened last night? We've figured out everything except for whether or not I slept with Polly. Oh! Hey. Phil here partied hard last night. Many of their movies are copies of pre-existing films, a lot of them being horrors. While Demon Tongue isn't a direct copy and paste of any one film, it showcases only the most obvious, overused tropes from the genre while telling a story that I still don't fully understand after four viewings. My DVD that I purchased with actual human dollars from Amazon.com claims that the movie is about four paranormal research students who go to an abandoned complex to conduct an investigation into strange occurrences that the locals feel are the result of demonic possessions. Amateur ghost hunters get more than they bargained for. What? That's a bit redundant, right? And why isn't amateur capitalized? This really isn't getting off to a good start. I mean, I suppose the demon lady on the cover looks alright. She has pretty cool makeup and the split tongue is a nice tie-in to the title. Unfortunately, I can tell you guys right now that not only is this level of makeup far superior to what you will see in the actual film, this demon lady is nowhere to be found. She's not in the movie at all! Whatever, let's just keep going. Something seemed off with the DVD itself when I took it out of the case. It's a DVD plus RW disc made in somebody's house with a printed sticker label placed on top of it. I assure you this is not a bootleg. I really did pay for this movie on Amazon. Oh, okay, that's, <laughs> that's cool, I guess. Oh god. Gavin Rapp, who also served as editor, starts the movie off with a flashback scene. How do we know it's a flashback? It's got this filter with thin, black lines running vertically through the image and white specks here and there added in post, of course. A woman tells her two children to go to bed and she says she'll be right up to tuck them in. <laughs> She begins to hear strange, demonic voices that tell her to draw pictures in a notebook. It was at this point that I began to notice just how horrifically bad the sound design is in this movie. Before I go any further, I want to make something very clear. This movie was made by amateurs. Now, when I say that word, I'm in no way trying to use it in a negative manner. I myself am an amateur at video editing. I taught myself about a month ago and I really only know the basics. That being said, the people involved with Demon Tongue either don't understand any aspect of filmmaking and they were just winging it, or at some point they just wanted the entire process to be finished and they gave up. It's kind of ugly, isn't it? Back to the scene. The sound of her pencil does not match up to the strokes she's drawing. The sound effect was mixed in and it is done very poorly. I don't understand why they had to add in a sound effect in post anyway, seeing as later on they use the actual sound captured from the camera when she's finger painting. A demon appears while she's drawing. The mask looks like they had a budget of $14.95 and a handful of jelly beans and they stopped by Party City on the way to filming. This is the main demon of the film and that was what they came up with? At this point she must have remembered that she told her kids she'd be up to tuck them in two and a half hours ago and she goes upstairs with an axe because the voices told her to. She drags one of her dead children downstairs wrapped in a sheet and she throws it into the furnace. Her husband arrives home, sees the murder 
murder scene, doesn't seem overly upset about it due to his blank-faced acting, and then he gets axed himself. The woman calls 911, still hearing voices, and then she uses her inside gasoline can, as well as gas from her oven, double gas, to blow the house up as the police arrive. Who keeps a gasoline can in their house? Especially when you have kids. It's not like she went outside to get it from the shed or the garage. It was just around this corner here. For my family. <laughs> anyway, there's a B-roll explosion and then now we're in present day. A brunette college girl named Madison picks up her blonde friend Chloe from a dorm room and then they go to get coffee at the coffee shop. This scene has the second worst sound design that I have ever witnessed in my entire life, only behind Birdemic in terms of its utter failure. Thank you. I'll be right back with you. The entire scene is dubbed. Basically, they shot the scene, they called it a wrap, they filmed the rest of the movie, and then it came time to edit the film, and Gavin must have realized that you couldn't hear any goddamn thing they were saying. They had the two actresses re-record their lines in a studio, and then tried to match the dialogue to the scene. It didn't work. At all. The actresses' lips don't match up to the words they're saying. So where is this new place anyway? It's almost impossible to document anything. I can't believe that is all that he told you. The video has been sped up and slowed down in an attempt to synchronize it. You can tell that the shots are not at full speed. Even with all of the hours that must have been spent trying to get everything to line up, to get the lips to match the voice, it still looks absolutely awful. They couldn't just cut the whole scene because this is a character building scene for the two leads. I don't know. We talk, and then we rip each other's clothes off. <laughs> oh my gosh. In the scene, we learn that both girls are seeing different guys, and that all four are about to go on a trip for school. See, this scene was completely necessary. We learn that Madison is having weird flashbacks to a murder and hearing voices. Remember the brunette kid from the opening? The little girl? Remember how the mom only dragged one kid to the furnace? Huh? Huh? Hint, hint. <laughs> All four students are now on a road trip in a car. It is implied due to the fact that Madison is waking up from a dream that they have been driving for quite some time. They are only going about five miles per hour, but she asks the driver to slow down. Then this happens. How much further, Chloe? Uh, I about two miles. And Ethan, it's time to get a GPS. Oh, oh my god. Okay, so they've been driving for a while. Chloe would have no clue what road they're even on. They have never been here before, and she wasn't even paying attention. Instead of getting an idea of where they're located from her boyfriend Ethan, the driver, she just pulls up a map from the floor and looks at it with no frame of reference whatsoever. Now when I say a map, I don't mean like a map map. I mean a fucking wall map that was laminated and then clumsily folded into quarters. She struggles to open this awkward 3 by 3 three foot wall map for a few seconds and then literally the second she has it open she says about, about two, two miles. miles you have no fucking clue where you are even if you did you wouldn't be able to find yourself on the map find the destination on the map and gauge the distance in a fraction of a second then she tells her boyfriend he needs to get a gps later you learn that they all have smartphones because it's 2013 or 2016 or 2017 what does any of this have to do with the movie why does this scene exist after seeing how bad it turned out, why didn't they just fucking cut it? It adds nothing to the story. It is in this following scene that we learn that they are students in a paranormal activity class, like it said on the back of the DVD. And that would be the supernatural phenomenon in modern society class. You'd know that if you'd ever shown up. And they're all going to a location to do ghost research. Chloe's annoyed that she has to spend her entire weekend doing this boring thing for a class that she doesn't like, when they've only seen signs of a ghost once in four attempts. What? You've actually found signs of a ghost before, and you're annoyed with how boring and uneventful ghost hunting is? Because you only have a 25% ghost sighting record? You've seen a ghost! And you still feel this isn't worth your time? What? Your character doesn't make any sense. 
The gang arrives at this bar and they meet the owner. He paid the university. He paid the university to send ghost hunters to get rid of any evil spirits they may find because the locals feel that the place is haunted and it's hurting his sales. He creates a big huff because he is genuinely upset that the university sent college kids. I can't believe I'm wasting my money on a group of college kids. He takes them on a long hike through tall grass to a volleyball court, cabana place where the ghosts are apparently living and then he leaves them for the weekend. Apparently, a year ago, the bartender on duty committed suicide at this cabana and ever since, the area hasn't been used because of his spirit haunting everything. Never mind the fact that the padding and the nets for the volleyball court's brand new and there's no dirt on the bar or the tables that they use later. Also, I understand that no one's been there in a year like they said and the grass would be tall on this path because no one's been walking it, but did patrons really take a hike up hills and walk this long distance just to get to these volleyball courts? There's no easier way to get there? I guess not, it's just super secluded and off the beaten path and just go with it. Ethan is talking about how serious he takes the class and how they just have to find ghosts because he needs to get an A in the class. Really? Your grade is based off whether or not you find ghosts and you took the class anyway? Why would you take a class that is scientifically improbable to pass? Also, what major requires you to take a paranormal activity class anyway? Can you get a bachelor's degree in ghost hunting? Anyway, they set up the cameras and they scope out the area and then there's, uh, yeah. Madison keeps getting cold and having more and more visions. She can really sense something evil is here. The entire the entire second act of the film plays out as follows. The gang will be inside the cabana and then something will happen that will make them go outside. Then they'll go back inside until the same fucking thing happens again and then they'll go outside again. Ethan and Jacob, the other boyfriend, I don't think I said his name yet, they go out with ghost meters and they see red eyes in the darkness off in the distance. Their meter starts freaking out and then this happens. What's it say? Jesus! <laughs> You've got to be shitting me. Are you serious? No jump scare? I can't believe it. Any shitty horror film would have added a jump scare cue just like this right there. Good on you, Gavin. Not taking the easy way out. Oh, never mind. Later, Jacob and Madison are watching the cameras. By the way, these aren't motion sensing cameras or thermal cameras or even night vision cameras. They're just three camcorders that they screwed to poles around the area. Jacob sees a shadow that Madison misses. He claims he's sure he saw something. It's a camera. Play the video back and make sure. No? Oh, okay, just go follow it then. Like I said, inside, outside, inside, outside. They find this basement door on the far side of the volleyball courts. Hmm. I'm not sure this makes any sense, but let's keep watching. Jacob says that it looks like they built the cabana on top of an old house. Wait. What? No. What? No. This is the fucking basement from the beginning flashback scene? How? That house exploded. This doesn't work. It, no, it doesn't make sense. Stop telling me to believe stuff that is impossible. So the movie really is telling you that this is, in fact, the basement from the house at the beginning. So somehow the explosion didn't damage the basement at all, and it appears just as it did all those years ago. When the police investigated the murder explosion, they didn't take evidence from the basement. It's literally untouched. The husband was murdered with an axe, and the son was put into the furnace down there, but there's no evidence taken and there's no police tape or anything? Also, there are fully grown trees surrounding this basement entrance. There was an explosion. How did these trees grow back already? I mean, I understand the concept that the volleyball courts are located where the house itself sat, but all of the surrounding trees would be decimated, and if they started growing back, they wouldn't be like 50, 100 year old trees yet. It's been 20 years tops. And if this place is so successful, Secluded to the point they had to hike there. Where's the road that the house sat on in the beginning? No part of this makes any sense when you think about it for a second. Also, I thought this brunette girl was supposed to be the daughter from the beginning. Remember the whole hint hint thing? But like, she would be killed, right? Even if she wasn't murdered by the mom, because it only showed the mom drag one dead kid down to the basement. Like, she'd still be dead from the explosion. I mean, she's having visions of it. She's brunette. 
she's at an age that would make sense with the timeline, and it showed only one dead kid earlier, yet she doesn't recognize her own house? It was at this point I realized she couldn't be the daughter. She just has a sixth sense for no reason, and I was looking far too deeply into a story that has no point. This kid's flashlight can't decide if it's blue or yellow. It keeps changing back and forth. Sometimes it's both colors at the same time. Quit shining the goddamn light into the camera. They find the strange writing on the door that you saw earlier and they get freaked out and they leave. They send an image of the symbol to their professor. We're watching a horror film and it's been a half an hour, so it's time to see some tits. After the sexy time, Chloe is trying to find her shirt and she gets her arm slashed by something under the pool table. Ethan investigates. <laughs> Such an asshole. Jacob and Madison tell Ethan that they found the basement with strange symbols in it. You know, Ethan, the guy that planned this trip, the guy that needs to find a ghost to get an A. Looks like you've seen a ghost. Did you? That would get us an A. And he mocks them and tells them that they're just seeing what they want to see. There is no consistency to character personalities in this movie. People just do whatever the fuck they want to make the story progress. Professor Harris, their professor, receives the text message from Jacob's phone, the phone they could have used as a GPS earlier, and he starts to- Wait a second. No. It can't be. No. It's him. Writer. Director. Two-time star of Corpsing. It's Jeff Monahan. Thank God. Save this mess, Jeff! We need you! Our hero. Did you ever know that you're my hero? Our savior. And everything I'd like to be. I could fly higher than an eagle. Oh, a true American you hero. Are the wind. When you're in trouble and you need a friend, call up Jeff Monahan. <laughs> Madison is losing her shit at this point, and she makes a salt circle with candles to protect herself from the spirits. We learn that Professor Harris is so intrigued by their discoveries that he's on his way there. I guess he only has four kids in his entire class and has nothing better to do than check up on them and their progress over his weekend break. The lady from the beginning shows up in this incredibly artistic shot. Isn't that fucking cool, guys? She heals Chloe's wounds and then possesses her or something, and then summons her back to the basement. Inside, outside, inside, outside. Why does this basement always have so much light emitting from it, but whenever they go down there, they need flashlights because it's so fucking dark? Shortly after this, she lures her boyfriend Ethan into the basement with promises of more sexy time, and then she eats his face. The next day, Madison wakes up in a haze, and no one can find Ethan. Chloe is acting strange, and Jacob keeps asking her where Ethan is, but she just keeps saying she doesn't know. Jacob tries calling him, which means he himself also has a phone they could have been using as a GPS, and they still get no response. Uh, the, the phone, the phone's not on. The suggestion that maybe he's gone into the basement to do research is thrown out there, because apparently whenever he's mad, he throws himself into his work. You mean like early? when he mocked you? When he was upset and didn't believe anything you were saying? He isn't there, so the film wastes more time by having people sit around wondering what's going on and then they make some sandwiches. They finally do some research online and they find out about the murders that happened. The explosion from the beginning, the bartender suicide, and the hauntings that keep occurring in this area. Is this a flashback? I can't tell. There's no black lines or white dots. Children found axed to pieces. Okay, so for sure both kids died. Then why did the girl scream before the explosion if she was already axed to death? Also, five dead. No, six dead. The mom, the two kids, the dad, and the two cops. One plus two is three, plus one is four, 
plus 2 is 6. 5 dead once again implies that the daughter lived. You can now see why I'm so fucking confused, because this movie has no idea what it's trying to communicate. Not only is the story incredibly convoluted to begin with, they blatantly use incorrect and inconsistent information. To sum everything up the best I can, all 6 people died that night. Madison is not the daughter, she just has these random visions of the murders because she has ghost sense or something. Nothing more was supposed to be communicated or implied. It took me four separate viewings to understand this. It says here that they found the remains of a journal. In the house that exploded. Ah, there, I knew it. She says she's followed a voice. Really? After reading this one article, you are already convinced with zero additional research that the voices this lady heard and the voices you're hearing are the same voices? Better jump to conclusions to make excuses so that the plot can fit together. Finally! He's here! Their hunky, attractive professor shows up. Have you experienced anything? I don't know. I mean, we do have some rather unexplainable footage and some interesting audio clips. And of course, the basement. The voices? Visions? Are those not worth mentioning? It's called Stygian. Otherwise known as demonic speech. The demon tongue. Oh, that's why they call it that. This scene highlights the other huge problem with the sound design for the film. In many scenes, there is only dialogue audio in the left channel. When I watch films, I watch most of them with headphones, and this was very distracting for me. I don't know. Could have been a cult. In the past, I have rendered a video and it renders with voiceover in only the left channel. It's a really easy fix. You just go back and you copy the left channel into the right channel to turn it to stereo. I generally finish editing a video, I render it, and then I watch it to find any issues I need to fix, and then I re-edit them as I go along. Either Gavin didn't edit the audio with headphones on, which is absurd, meaning he didn't notice these issues because he couldn't hear them, or he was just so fucking tired of this movie and he wanted it to be done. I guess it's possible that he just couldn't edit anymore with his computer because it kept freezing. I mean, I'm just I'm just grasping for ideas here because I just don't understand how this was made. In certain scenes, it seemed as though he wanted the dialogue of characters on the left side of the screen to play only in the left channel, and then the characters on the right side of the screen would only play in the right channel. Dude, you could give us a hand. Somebody has to man the camera. Ever heard of a tripod? You ever heard of a tripod? And I noticed this in two scenes, and I mean, although it sounds awful and the idea was stupid, I could see what he was going for. But the rest of these scenes, it's like he just didn't notice or didn't care, because there's only audio in one of the channels, and the other channels are like sound effects or music, and it just sounds horrible. Did you hear that? Let's play it one more time. You know what that is? It's a car driving by. A really loud fucking car. A car driving by this secluded area that they had to hike through tall grass to get to. Why didn't they just reshoot the scene? I can understand how an amateur filmmaker could miss some of the mic taps that are all over this film, or the thuds that are louder than anticipated, but everyone heard that car. It was super loud. This is not a small mistake. It contradicts everything that you've claimed to be true about this location location. Professor Harris tells them about the research that he has done and about how there have been many more murders in this area and then they head out to find Chloe. They find her in the basement once again and they use a ghost meter on her. Her readings are off the charts. They take her back to the cabana. Inside, outside, inside. This scene is the worst mixed scene of the entire film. The levels are all wrong and you can't hear what anyone is saying. The music and the background bug chirps wash out the dialogue completely. If you want him so bad, you go. What'd you say to me, bitch? Let's focus. Again, easy fix. You just go back and you change the levels. If anybody cared, this would have been fixed without any trouble at all. Hey girl, I love the care in the background. You like that, ladies? You like a man who speaks a foreign language? The, uh, the sattva. Along with the Rajas and the Thomas make up uh, what's known as the Trigunas. Oh god, it's corpsing all fucking over again with all the mumbo jumbo nonsense. Gastrobiotics. Limbic. System.
Professor Harris is going to run the findings over to a colleague of his, and he asks Chloe to accompany him. Hey, where did this actual path come from? No! I'll never forget you, Jeff! Back at the volleyball courts, we see that Madison has dug a hole in the sand in her sleep and she's uncovered a skeleton hand. Even if you ignore the fact that this is an obvious plastic Halloween prop and that it's above ground level, sticking up higher than the sand that surrounds it even though it was supposed to be buried underground, it doesn't make any sense still. Yeah, I get that this is where the house was, allegedly, whatever. They just didn't find this one skeleton in the wreckage? Even if they missed a body, it would be below the sand. Because, in theory, this place was cleared out and then sand was poured on top of it to make these volleyball courts after the explosion. But the skeleton was uncovered inside of the sand and not below it in the dirt? Is this what they mean when they said five dead bodies earlier? Like they didn't find the sixth? I'm gonna just stop now. This is another rabbit hole and I refuse to go down it because I'm just gonna get more fucking pissed. Madison sees the dead girl from the beginning for some reason that I still don't understand and then she follows her for another reason that I still don't understand. Oh, Oh no, it's a trap! Chloe drags her into the basement and Jacob runs after her to save her. We find out from Chloe that the demon needs to use Madison as a vessel for his rebirth. She's the chosen one because she's pure, being a virgin. So was the daughter at the beginning of the movie not a virgin? Was she some sort of like second grade whore or something? Why didn't the demon just possess her in the first place and get it over with? She was pure, right? Jacob finds Chloe, but the demon kills him in the process. Then Madison Madison uses her telekinesis that she just now randomly has even though she never had it earlier at any point and she beats all the bad guys. <laughs> Yay. We see that Madison all of a sudden has a revolver that looks suspiciously similar to the one that the bartender killed himself with in the flashback of that suicide earlier. This is where any coherence that the film may or may not have had is completely thrown away. Don't ask me where the gun came from. Why are there four cameras instead of three now? How did the cameras see these things that it's showing when they happened in places the cameras weren't located? What is she uploading them to? Okay. Okay, I guess now we're seeing what really happened to the bartender. I don't know where this footage came from. Apparently, he didn't commit suicide. He was shot by someone who had feminine hands, meaning it was a woman. The person that shot him staged it to look like a suicide. The gun that is placed on his dead body isn't the same gun he was shot with. How did forensics not see that he had no gunpowder on his hand and that the bullet didn't match the gun? What is this trying to imply? Was someone possessed and then shot him? Was it Madison? I mean, she has the gun now. How did she get the gun if it wasn't her? But I mean, if that's the case, what does any of this mean? Well, the bar owner returns, and he sees that Madison isn't doing well, and he begins to carry her back to safety. It shows her eyes, and they're like red and possessed now or something, implying I guess she didn't kill the bad guys, and then she shoots him with this revolver, and then the film ends. <laughs> I am not making a joke right now. If anyone could explain to me what the fuck the last five minutes of this movie is supposed to mean, I would greatly appreciate it. Put it in the comments. It feels like a tacked on twist that isn't related to the movie we just watched. Did the demon get inside her like it intended to and it's using her as a vessel now? If that's the case, it wouldn't explain any of the gun and bartender stuff. The story for the film doesn't make any sense. For instance, 
existence? Why does the demon possess people in an inconsistent manner? The first lady just heard voices and then she axed people. Chloe turned into a demon type thing and she slashed people with her claws that she got. And then Madison just like shoots people? So what's the point of the film? Does this demon just get humans to kill people in completely random ways for fun and then he tries to find a host arbitrarily when he feels like it? I have no answers after watching this film. Even the credits are confusing. Why are they Grindhouse inspired? That style wasn't used at all until now. These people seem like they had a good time working on the film. I mean, I can't be mad at them for that. These photos implied to me that they did care. That they didn't just try to bullshit the film. Like, look at how much fun they're fucking having. So the answer that I've been searching for this entire review is that the terrible filmmaking had to have stemmed from a complete lack of knowledge and no attention to detail. These amateurs set out to make a movie with a script that didn't make any sense, they had no money, and they had very little experience. The result is one of the worst films that I have ever seen. Demon Tongue gets a 1 out of 10. Ah!